As an actor, he's performed everything from Beckett and Pinter to Mel Brooks and the Farrelly Brothers. He's a musician who writes all the music for his best-selling DVDs and is undoubtedly the biggest-selling comedian in the UK today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Lee Evans, even closer. Lee, here we are again. <laughs> Sat yeah. down again. I know. Once more, chat, chat time. Um, it's interesting, looking back over your work, as I have been, yeah. before I was going to come sit down with you today, the scale of this thing has just got bigger and bigger and bigger with each tour. Was yeah. this something that you were anticipating? Um, no. No, it wasn't. Uh, when we was doing the alternative comedy circuit, uh, I remember actually uh, there was nowhere to go. You do the circuit, you do Friday Night Live one weekend, and then the next weekend you'd be back on stage with uh, Arthur Smith and, uh, and whoever, you know, it, uh, at the comedy store or John Glers or wherever you're performing. So there was nowhere for uh, comedians to go. And then I think it was either Jack D or, or Frank Skinner or Eddie Izzard and stuff, and uh, dare I say myself, sort of wanted to see if it would work in theatres. So we started to do theatres and uh, people would turn up. And we couldn't believe that there was somewhere like somewhere else to go because on the alternative circuit you just seemed to hit a ceiling there was never yeah. anywhere to go you're doing a bit of telly and then you go back to the circuit you know yeah. where people shout at you and they're sick in front of you and all that sort of stuff you know <laughs> get off you crap <laughs> uh so uh but we made this sort of jump into theaters and it was a, a risk a, we, we took a chance we did uh, wembley arena to see if it would go into arenas and uh and people came the jump from, I mean, because theatres, some theatres are quite intimate. They, they were designed, the Victorian theatres, to yeah. foster that sense of intimacy, that closeness with the crowd. I know, but... But an arena's a very different I thing. I know, but I was always frustrated by that. I was always yeah. frustrated by the limitations, first of all, of a comedy club, because you couldn't do anything. You couldn't do music or you couldn't do anything with the set. Mm. And I wanted to write sort of like routines, rude set pieces. I, yeah. I was always fascinated by sound effects and music and all that. But you couldn't do that in a comedy club. You could do stand-up or, or, or bring a prop on or whatever, but the limitations of the club always held you back. And then when you got into theatres, like you say, you know, like Leeds City Varieties, which is a fantastic small theatre mm. to do because people are right there. But then you start getting more ambitious in your head and you want to do bigger things. And then the sort of first show went really well. And then we all went, oh, let's do a tour. Yeah. Let's see what would happen if we do a tour. And then it got into a situation where we was having these discussions. You went, you know... Um, we do nine nights in Manchester. Why don't we just do one at a big place? Yeah. You know, or 14 nights in Nottingham or whatever it is. But it, it seems that it, even though you do this, you scale up to the larger rooms, the demand still ramps up. And so you still end up, you're in Cardiff, you have to do four or five nights in Cardiff at the CIA, which yeah. is a, like a five, six thousand oh, But we room. didn't expect that. That was the thing. We didn't know that was going to happen. We thought we'd do one night yeah, in But it's like Field of Dreams. Night. It's like if you build it, they will come. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how big you seem to make your tours. It's like, we only like Evans if he's working five nights yeah. a week in the town. Well, we do. Our, our audience, I like that, though. Mm. They will come. If you meet them outside the stage door, they're ordinary, working-class people, mm. and they say, no, we're going out. We're going to see Lee, and that's it. It doesn't matter. They could cancel trains. There'd be no planes or whatever. They'd still turn up. They'd, just, they'd, just, they'd come and say, no, I just want to see what he's doing. Like, you know, because they've seen you over the years, they've yeah. seen, and I really respect that. You know, I, I mean, I've, I've actually been <laughs> in a venue, and someone shouts something out because they're drunk or something, and you've seen people around and go, now listen, if you're going to do that here, while Lee's on, I'm going to itch you. You know, I've seen that happen. You've got, oh, blimey, you know. You seem very aware of the responsibilities of the job. Massive. I do so. Actually, my wife has a go at me for it, because I know this is going to sound a bit mad, but I do feel responsible, I do, overly so, and it's really tiring. Because mm. uh, you think, oh, I know that these people have paid money to see you, you're very privileged to be able to do it, because yeah. you've the old days when we had nothing, and, uh, and it's really good to be doing this nice gig, the things you sort of dreamt about doing when you were yeah. a kid, you know. And I do absolutely, 24 hours a day, think about that. When we're on tour, I think, no, and, 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 and you get blokes on the stage door go, uh, we had so-and-so here last week, they just don't, don't have to sign nothing, just go. And you're like, no, I'll stand there, I'll sign stuff if people have come to see us. And yeah. I do, absolutely, I really do um, uh, feel a responsibility for people that have paid their money to come and see us. And, and of course, you know, it's, it's a bigger work operation as well. How big's the crew on your tour? Well, it started like... off at two, 
me and you and Gratz. Gratz. Yeah. We turn up at a theatre. Uh, uh, Gratz has been um, touring with myself and, and you. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Jack D for years. And it's just big. It used to be just me and Gratz turn up at a theatre and Gratz would say, oh, we'll have a bit of white light. We've got a, a back cloth. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but then it got... And then Gratz, when it got to arenas, Gratz was suddenly the governor. He had a belt with pen knives on it, and he's going, yeah, yeah, get them lights over there, you. And they're all, all these crew are listening to him, you know what I mean? And he'd sort of come back to me and go, you all right? Everything all right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'd go, right, just, yeah, you lot over there. You know, he was, uh, oh, good luck to him, because he, he does, he is a creative uh, force yeah. on tour as well, because if I say to him, listen, Grats, I want to get these spots and so on, and then he'll go off and he'll, he'll have a chat with the lighting blokes and then yeah. sort it all out. You know, I mean, like on the last tour, I said, I, I said, I think I said to Grats, I said, wouldn't it be great to have this big giant earth as we're singing the song, going around the audience. And yeah, okay, I'm gonna get joint earth from. <laughs> you know, cause, uh, and then we did, we found this bloke and he says, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it for 50 quid. I've got my own earth. And what he does, he fills it with helium and he, he clips it to his belt and yeah. it's got on wires like this and he just sort of trapes around the audience with this giant. <laughs> um, and then I think it was even me or Gratz or one of the crew was talking to him and he let it go. <laughs> he let it go and it went up the ceiling and, and all the crew watched it go I went oh no there goes your earthly and I said oh no no there must be a way and, this, and all the crew got out bows and arrows <laughs> they were shooting at it and chucking spears at it with like pen knives on the thing to pop it to bring it down and it came down and we managed to patch it up I think just over I think it was uh, New South Wales we put a patch on that was nice yeah and then we, um, we sort of got it up and going again the Elvises was a great image yeah these things when you think of these there's you and... St I mean, it's you. How, how many of these things are you like, you're in the car, I don't know, you're with the family. You're like, you know what, we're on next game. Well, the idea behind that was because that was... I th I'm not sure, I think it might have been the, the first arena tour, and the notion in my head was always Elvis has left the building. Yeah. And I wanted to get loads of Elvises on. <laughs> Me leave the building, but leave them there. <laughs> Thank you. How much does that many Elvises run you? Well, actually, it, I'll be honest with you, in the end, we didn't have enough. So we were out in the street in Cardiff going, you look like Elvis. And the bloke going, <laughs> what? No one's ever said that to me before, but all right, I'll come along and do the gig. I think it's probably all the towns in the world. Cardiff's a belter for Elvis lookalikes. It is, you know. <laughs> they love a sideburn Oh, they in love Cardiff. a sideburn, yeah. <laughs> and a quiff. <laughs> I had a great time, I have to say, on that, um, on that, that, that particular show. I really like Cardiff performing it. It's a great city to be. And the process from the very early knockings of a tour to it being finished. Yeah. Is that what, two years? Two years, yeah. I mean, I don't know how, how other people work. Um, yeah. I've always worked the same. I'm quite an intense bloke, insecure, really insecure. Yeah, I mean, it's all comics, really. Well, yeah, that's what know, we're doing it failure, for, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Does it start with you, or you and Stuart, who you write with, I know, and does things It with starts you? with myself, yeah. writing loads of notes, and I get a big pile of notes about that big, which yeah. is about four hours worth of stuff. And then I'll go and see me mate Stuart. Yeah. And then I'll go through it with him. And he'll go, nah, it's rubbish, that's crap. And then we'll sort of <laughs> whittle it down to about three hours. And then we start writing together. Um, uh, basically, like you would in a, in a room with a mate. 
Yeah. Because uh, we've known each other many, many years now, and we'll sit in a room, as you would a mate, just chatting. Yeah. And then I'll sort of get my laptop out if I think something's funny. And then, yeah. and then Stuart splits off, and I go off on my own and sort of try and figure it around. How long before you put it on stage in any kind of form, sort of start working it at little clubs and things? Uh, Is that part of the process as well? Yep, yeah, yeah, about six months. We go and try it out in small clubs and we do uh, about 20 minutes of new material and the, the people that run the Glee clubs in Cardiff and Birmingham yeah. have been really kind to us over the years and they let us sort of go there every weekend and, um, and try stuff out. So we walk on stage with a bunch of notes yeah. At the end of the gig, so we're not disturbing the gig at all. Yeah. Uh, and then you sort of see all the other comedians sort of like gather at the back and go, what's she doing there? <laughs> and you, and I, I, I always, so when I go in, I'm, I don't want to disturb you. I'm really sorry if I'm upsetting the gig, but I'm going on when they're all pissed anyway. Yeah. So that, you know, so I'm not disturbing the gig and they're fine with it. So we go on at the end and just try uh, 20 minutes out. If some bits work, I'll go back to the hotel where I'm staying at. Then I'll rework it and... Because um, I get really worried. I'm such a. Uh, I like things in their place. And, and then you, you want it it's sort of in a finished shape before you do the first arena. It's got to yeah, be. Yeah, it's got to be how it how in your head you wanted it yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. And then once we're doing the arenas, because it changes, it changes in theatres, it changes in clubs, and then you start again switching it around. Because I didn't know when you play an arena. They, if you go over time, they fine you. I didn't know you got it's fined. That weird thing, it's that you, but you're in a, I know, you're a very intense performer. It's like, yeah, but you like, say that to the like management. You've got enough per <laughs> pressure. You say, look, I'm enjoying myself, the audience is enjoying it, can yeah. you just carry on? And they go, no, no, you've got to, you've got to go, otherwise yeah. you get fined. Because uh, one bloke in Newcastle was telling me, and he's absolutely right, he said, look, uh, we got 15,000 people here in this arena. And if we just put them all out on the street at 12 o'clock, yeah. there's no trains, no buses or anything. Yeah. And so you need to be off stage at 11 o'clock so everyone can get home. Now, I didn't realise that. I love you very much. Good night. God bless. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Looking back at the, um, the arena gigs, the things that I've noticed is you're changing as a performer as you get on. You're actually... It's weird. It's because you're actually calming down a little. Yeah. You're slightly less frenetic. Yeah. It's more considered. But the physicality, if anything, is more precise. Yeah, it's I know. It's still there, the energy and the physicality. But there there's, appears more intent to it. It's I know. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of like, um, there's a catch to it, isn't there? Because like in the early days when we was doing that, everything was new. The alternative circuit was new. Mm. The comedy was new. There was people diving off of, you know, uh, steps into a bowl of water, you know. Yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. ridiculous stuff that was going on stage. And everything was new. And you'd be pumping yourself up and having heart attacks on stage. And then, <laughs> and, um, and then I suppose as you go on, you sort of want to as an individual, you want to grow and see if you can get better at what you do. And that's, I suppose that's the trouble because then it might even hold you up by going, oh God, maybe I shouldn't or, because in the old days you didn't really know much about it and you just went for it, I suppose. Yeah, there was, there was one bit that I, I saw that particularly that just, for me, it's almost like, it's a very short little thing. Mm. But if I, if I wanted to just kind of explain how good you were to someone, I'd go, mm. and it's, the, it's, the, it's a caravan joke. Right. And you, you talk about people that go on caravan in holidays and you do this thing and you go, we, we like going caravan because we like going to the wide open spaces. And then you do someone moving in a caravan and you hit yourself, <laughs> you hit yourself like 30 times with the yeah. microphone yeah. moving around. Yeah. That is ballet, my friend. That's so precise. I do like the wide open spaces, don't you, dear? Ow! You know what, I, I love doing stuff like that. I absolutely love, I've, I love physical stuff. The only problem is, is if you do that night after night after night, you, the, the pleasure you get from it is the audience laugh. Yeah, yeah. That, to hear that sound is, is, to me, is amazing. I love that sound. I, that sound, I always feel that if that's happening, I'm doing something positive on the planet. I'm not killing no one, nothing's happening at my gig. All they're doing is laughing, yeah. so that's good. Unfortunately, that hurts, right? <laughs> so after gig 127, banging yourself on the forehead and on the back of the head and all that, you get to that just before that joke's happening. You go, oh no, 
Oh, no. Here we go. Here we go with the head banging with the microphone thing, and it, it hurts. And then you get to this point where you go, oh, no, this is going to hurt. But then, you know, uh, what, what levels that off is the laughter from the audience, so then that drives you on, sort of, to do it bigger and... It's interesting for me, I mean, as, a, as, a, as another comedian sort of looking at what you do, mm. that, that, that you return to themes quite often. You, there's recurrent themes in your work, and always has been. Um, yeah. I find it fascinating that you would think that you'd run every possible gag out of, <laughs> you know, be it holidays or animals or your relationship, you know, yeah. with your wife or, or men and women. You can come back to them and there's new stuff, you know. Yeah. How does that... How does that... I think generally our set, uh, uh, m my material, is generally what I see. Yeah. And that's probably all I see, you know. I've been married for 25 years, so... I see her every day, uh, you know, and I've got a daughter and we go shopping and we do, uh, we go on journeys and stuff like that. So I can only talk about what I see. I don't physically write a note, you know, if you're down the pub and someone says, oh, I've got one here, right? Why mm. do divers, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. fall backwards off the back of a boat, right? Because otherwise, if they fall forward, they end up in the boat. <laughs> and I go, oh, I must write that down. Um, <laughs> what I do is I, I think I'm talking to somebody, and then about six months later, when I'm sat at my laptop, I go, oh, yeah. And then it just comes out somehow. I mm. don't know how that happens, but yeah. it just does. And I think what you generally see in our set is generally what we get up to. Or I read the newspapers, and then I, I do find the world slightly ridiculous. Um, and so I kind of write from that point of view. I mean, I do like it when you... You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we to a certain extent want comedians to point out those things that we don't see, you know, but mm. but there was, when you did that thing about our squirrels will stop dead and stare at you. Yeah. But it's just that, that, that you did, you had this, this little, little physical thing as well. That they, <laughs> that yeah, because I've seen them do it and I suppose you're just acting then that out for the audience, aren't you, really? It's when an animal just stops dead. You ever stare at a squirrel and they suddenly go... <laughs> Fuck, he's gonna go for me throat! <laughs> you should try it, it works. You know, someone picks on you out here on a Friday or a Saturday, you looking at my bird, go like, ah. <laughs> Fuck, I'll leave him alone, I think. <laughs>